glad I'm here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Shake hands with somebody tonight as you have your seat. Glory be to Jesus. Oh, the Lord's good to us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank the Lord tonight. God is so good. Amen. Well, we're going to take just a moment and uh, receive our giving tonight. Hallelujah. You ready to give, ready to sow? The Lord's so good tonight. I'm not going to take a lot of time to, to, to teach over the, the giving tonight, just uh, uh, enough to say that there is an offering envelope there in the seat back in front of you if you would like to sow into the ministry tonight. Hallelujah. I believe, hallelujah, that as you sow, according to the scripture, you'll receive. And you know, that can be oversimplified, but that's something that's guaranteed. It's the law of seed time and harvest. I remember hearing Brother Copeland say years ago, probably 25 years ago now, he said, he said this, he said, a seed that you sow will return a harvest to you uninterrupted if you won't dig it up. It'll just perpetually give a return to you. And he wrote a little book called Giving and Receiving back in the 1980s. And in that book, he said this, he said, if there are things in your life that seem to be out of, out of kilter, especially financially, he said, do the same thing God did and give your way out of it. Because he said, when Adam wrecked his situation, the way God got out of that was he gave his best seed. He gave Jesus and he, and he rectified the situation. When, when you sow tonight, when you give into the ground of the kingdom of God, you're not, you're not just giving, you're not donating. You're not just giving to help keep the lights on, or you're sowing into the ground of the kingdom of God. And when you sow into the ground of the kingdom of God, God says, here's what I'll do. I'll give it back to you, and I'll give it back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'll cause men to give into your bosom. Hallelujah. And so your victory, your victory financially is in your hand tonight. And as you sow, the Bible says you surely will reap. Amen. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. Well, when you're ready to give tonight, why don't you lift your seed to the Lord? Father, we thank you for the seed that's being sown into the ground of the kingdom tonight. And we thank you that the ground of the kingdom will produce a return in the lives of your people. And Lord, you said in your word up to and including a hundredfold. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. We declare in the name of Jesus that our days of insufficiency are over in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can come rejoicing tonight in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. See, but the key is to come rejoicing. So, so we want to rejoice. Amen. Hallelujah. God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. As your under-shepherd of this body, Father, we thank you for the seeds that have been sown tonight. And as your people have given, we call them blessed, we call them favored, and we call them healed in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brothers. Amen. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Eric, and he's, he's going to come to us before Brother Jerry. Uh, but we do want to, uh, uh, of course, recognize our pastors that are with us tonight. Pastor Happy and Jeannie Caldwell, they're with us tonight, and we're so glad that you're here. Thank you very much. Amen. And uh, uh, the newest pastor of a Faith Builders Church, Pastor James Alexander from Faith Builders Pine Bluff. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, my mother is with us tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, so we're so glad she's here with us, Jeannie Steele. And she's, I think they're celebrating 60 years of ministry this year. 
So, or she is. Dad went to heaven four years ago, but she's still, still ministering. Amen. And uh, we're convincing her to come live closer to us. So, hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't the Lord good? You know, just before Eric comes, you know, you're here tonight and you're going to hear the word of God, but I'm convinced of something that there are rescues that are going to be given to you tonight. There are things that God's going to rescue you from, and you're going to find your answers here in this meeting tonight. And these are the meetings that will mark your life. And you'll look back over the, the next 20, 25 years, and you'll say, I remember that night when I received that word from God when Brother Jerry was ministering. So you want to get your, your ears out and get your note, notebook out, get your Bible out, and be ready to receive in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And Pastor Oscar London, God bless you, sir. Good to have you tonight from uh, Stuttgart, Stuttgart, Arkansas. So good to have you tonight. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Eric D., and then, then he can uh, uh, bring Brother Jerry to the platform. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I'm Eric Deaton. I'm an associate minister at JSMI, and it's good to be with you here in Little Rock. And uh, how many of you, this is your first time uh, live in person with Dr. Savell tonight? This is your first time. Well, welcome, guys. It's good to have you. If you, don't, if you aren't familiar with his ministry, uh, they call him Mr. Favor or Dr. Favor all over the world, and he's put out more resources on the favor of God probably than anybody in our generation. And one of the things that he teaches with us is that we're blessed, that the blessing empowers us to prosper, and favor gives us opportunities or opens the door for the blessing to work. And so these are some of the things that favor does, supernatural increase and promotion, restoration of everything the devil has stolen. I like that one. Honor in the midst of our adversaries. Great victories in the midst of great odds. And I like this one, preferential treatment. It's that upgrade that you weren't expecting on the plane that you got. We were in uh, Birmingham, Alabama not long ago, and uh, we were staying downtown at a place, and there's this men's store that he likes to buy suits. Now, I would say he's one of the best-dressed preachers possibly in the world, and uh, Pastor Happy knows his love for for nice uh, <laughs> suits and things. Well, we went to, he took me over to the store and, and of course he went one way and I, I went straight to the sale rack. And uh, this, was a, this was a store that sells nice Italian uh, suits. And so anyway, I get to the sale rack and they have, I've become familiar with a brand called Canali. And it's an Italian brand. And uh, because he likes this brand and it was 50% off favor. But it was still $1,250. So I said, you know, that's still a good deal. I'm going to try this on. And I went over to the mirror and I looked at myself and I didn't fit exactly right, you know, and I, I got to think about it. So I put it back on the rack and, and um, I just, I don't know, I just didn't get it. And he said, you see anything you like? I said, yeah, but it just didn't fit exactly right. And so we checked out and went about our way. Well, that night at the church, he didn't know this, but they had gotten him a gift card to that same men's store. So guess where we went the next day? Back to the men's store. And so I walked in. I went straight for the 50% uh, rack because I thought maybe it would fit different today. And I looked at the sticker, and it had been marked down since yesterday from $1,250 to $400. Favor. So that's what happens when you hang out with Dr. Favor. Increased by association. So I went to the mirror. I tried it on. It fit perfect. Fit perfect. So we checked out, and the, the man at the counter said, oh, Canali, $400. I ain't never seen it this cheap. I said, it's for favor. Went back to told the pastor. He goes, I know the owner. And he mentioned the, the guy's name. He said, I buy all my suits from him, and I've never had a suit, a Canali suit for $400. I said, favor, you know, hang out with Dr. Favor for a little bit. But that's what the favor of God will do for you. It will put you in places in divine appointments and divine people in the right place at the right time. And that's what he'll do for you. But you, until you get the knowledge of what it is, you, you won't recognize it. So that's why we put out this thing 
This is one of the books that uh, we got from Oral Roberts Ministry. It's called The Miracle of Seed Faith. And this is the book that Dr. Savell mentions that he learned how to make God his source. So when I hear him say that, I think, well, I want to read that book where he said he learned how to make God his source. And that's what this is, The Miracle of Seed Faith. So that's back there. And then this is the word of the Lord for this year, 2024. Progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion, and seeing your highest expectations fulfilled. Church, it's time we advance. It's time we progress. And it's so that God will get the glory that people will see us progressing. And they'll say, I want to know the God that you serve. I want to know what you're doing because I, I, I need what you've got. And that's what the whole purpose of this year is. And so you can begin to declare that. And I think we might have some of those bookmarks that you can stick in your Bible and begin to speak that over yourself for the rest of the year. Amen. Well, are y'all ready to hear the word tonight? Yes. Will you please welcome Dr. Jerry Savell? I hear something coming out of here now. Yeah. This one. How about this one? Yes. Yes. It's working now? I got to preach because I can't sing and dance, okay? <laughs> All right, we'll try this one again. That's working? Okay. <clears throat> Whatever it takes. Amen. We just don't quit. Just keep moving forward. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Once again, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're here just tonight, and then we're headed to Branson. Anybody going to Branson for Brother Copeland's victory campaign? So we'll be there uh, starting tomorrow night through Saturday. And uh, it's always a joy to preach to Brother Copeland. He and I have been preaching together now. This is my 54th year in ministry, and he and I have been preaching together for 53 years. And uh, we don't intend to stop. In fact, I'm not sure that Kenneth Copeland can ever do a Believer's Convention without Jerry Savelle, because there's never been one without Jerry Savelle, and it's such an honor. Uh, I love the man because of the fact that he's the one that God used to, to bring the Word to me when I was running from God just as hard and fast as I could. But in 1969, February, uh, I couldn't run anymore after hearing him preach on the Word of Faith, and uh, surrendered my life to the Lord, accepted the call to the ministry, and uh, shut my business down, my automotive business down, began preparing for full-time ministry. And the second time that he came back, about six months later, uh, he called me out of the audience. I'd just met him briefly uh, before that service, and uh, he called me out of the audience, and he said, I was in prayer today, and God showed me that you and I will be a team, and it's uh, we'll spend the rest of our lives preaching the Word of God together all over the world. He said, and it'll be your responsibility to believe God for the perfect timing for the team to begin. Then he said, sit down. Then he went on with his sermon. And, of course, I was very young in the Lord, hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit, but just a short time. And uh, back in those days, as far as I was concerned, Carolyn, my wife, and the Holy Ghost were one and the same. You know, and so she helped, you know, decipher everything for me. So I turned to her and I said, what did all that mean? She said, I think we're moving to Fort Worth, Texas. I said, why? She said, well, he said you're going to be a team, spend the rest of your lives preaching word all over the world. I thought, well, that'd be an honor. I mean, this is the man that brought the word to change my life, and then he and I are going to be a team for the rest of our lives. If, I don't call, if you don't call that the favor of God, I don't know what it is. 
So I've been walking in the favor of God since the day I came to the Lord. And that was the first thing God taught me that I didn't learn from Kenneth Copeland. I didn't learn from Kenneth Hagin. I didn't learn from Oral Roberts. And I didn't learn from T.L. Osmond, my four mentors. That's the first thing the Lord taught me was how to walk in the favor of God. Amen. And he said, there will come a day. And this is 1969. I was three months old in the Lord. I was in prayer one morning and he said, there will come a day that I'll hold you responsible for teaching others how to walk in my favor as you will. And there will come a day when your name will be known around the world for the favor of God that's on your life and ministry. Well, that didn't happen right away, but over a period of time, that's exactly what's happened. I, I call it my signature message. Uh, you know, would you listen to Kenneth Hagin? God raised him up from a deathbed, said, teach my people faith. And that's what he did his entire ministry. I mean, I had the privilege of preaching Brother Hagin many times. And uh, uh, I've heard the same sermons over and over again. In fact, there were times that I, I was sitting there in the audience listening and sitting next to his wife. And uh, I thought, if he, if he just walked over and said, Brother Jerry, take it from here. I knew all the stories. I knew where it was going. In fact, I heard him preach so much, I felt like I was born in McKinney, Texas, you know. And, but teaching people faith, that was his signature message. I heard several times people say, Brother Hagan, you've been preaching out of Mark 11, 23 and 24 all these years. When are you going to preach something different? He said, when you get this, we'll move on to something new. And I thank God that he just continued to do so. In fact, when Pastor Philip picked me up at the airport today, he had a Kenneth Hagan message going on in his car, and I'm the same way. I, I have in that briefcase that I carry everywhere with me, I have a little iPod in there that's got all those early messages of Kenneth Hagan uh, and Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, and T.L. Osborne, my four mentors, of those early messages that changed my life. I listen to them every day. Amen. I never get tired of them. And... Uh, you know, I've heard people say, I remember one time I was out in California and uh, <clears throat> I knew Brother Hagen was going to be in Riverside that same week and I had one night off, a Saturday night, and I had determined that I was going to be in his meeting. And I asked pastors uh, everywhere I had preached up to that point, are you going over to Brother Hagen's meeting in Riverside? And several of them said the same thing. No, we've already heard him. I thought, I hope to God I never get to the place where I have that kind of attitude. That's right. If you heard him, then you'd want to hear him again. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's right. the reason I'm still listening to him. Amen. That's the reason I'm still listening to Oral Roberts and Brother Copeland and T.L. Osborne. Those messages changed my life. Yeah. Amen. And I'm still living on those same principles that I learned because it's the Word of God. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. Yeah. Not one jot or tittle will ever pass away. So those messages never get old. Yes, right. Amen. Amen. They're, they're right up to date. If you go back and listen to something Kenneth Hagin said in 1970, I mean, it is right up to where we are right now. Amen. And I'm applying those same things I learned in 1970 Amen. to 2024, and they're still working in 2024, just like they did in 1970. Amen. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. So don't ever get to the place where you think, oh, I don't need to hear that anymore. No, you don't ever stop. Working. It's working now? Thank you, sir. Uh, would you give part of the offering to him, okay? <laughs> amen. I like this one better. Amen. So uh, with that in mind, guess what I'm going to talk about tonight? <laughs> favor. <laughs> amen. Favor. I want to talk to you about favor in troubled times, Amen. depending on the favor of God in troubled times. God is famous for being faithful to deliver his people in troubled times. Throughout the Bible, you find God's people experiencing troubled times time and time again, but God is always faithful to deliver them. Amen. If they did what he said and just stayed true to him, then he was always faithful to deliver them. And the Bible says that he changes not. Amen. So if he delivered them, then he will deliver us. Can you say amen? amen? 
Look at your neighbor and say, my God changes not. If he delivered them, he'll deliver you. And if you believe that, give him a good shout of praise. Amen. <clears throat> and it's very obvious that we are living in troubled times. I, 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 I told Carolyn, my wife here just a couple of days ago, I said, who would have ever believed that our nation would be in the condition it's in right now? I mean, five years ago, as, 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 as close as five years was, uh, I, I wouldn't think that this nation nor the world would be in the kind of condition that it is right now. We are living in troubled times. But Jesus made this statement. His disciples said to him, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 24. It said, uh, give us, show us the signs of the end. Yeah. And he described all these different things that would happen, trouble, chaos, you know, all these different things before uh, the end would come. And, and then he made this statement, but see that you be not troubled. Yeah. And, and I, I remember after I read that uh, years ago, I, I preached a sermon in one of Brother Copeland's Believers Convention, uh, living in troubled times, but not being troubled by it. Yeah. That means that we can live in troubled times and yet not be troubled by it. Yeah. Amen. 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 But you got to know what God says yeah. in order to not be troubled. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of Christians that are just like the rest of the world. They're, 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 they're troubled today. They don't know where to turn. That's strange to have a Christian say, I don't know where to turn. But you hear people talking like that. I don't know what to do. Well, uh, have you read the book lately? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe it's uh, time to turn CNN off and get in the right. WORD. Amen. 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 We know what to do. But are we doing it? But if you, if you study the Bible closely, you become fully aware that God is famous for delivering His people in troubled times. Amen. He did it then, He's doing it now, and He will continue to do it. So Jesus said, the end is not yet, but these are the beginning of sorrows. But then He says this, see that you be not troubled. So once again, it tells me that I can live in a troubled world, and everybody around me be troubled by the trouble, but I don't have to be troubled by it. Amen. Amen. I, just, I just refuse to be like everybody else. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm not normal. Now, some, you know, some people already know that, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not what the world would consider to be normal. I don't think like them. I don't talk like them. Amen. I don't act like them. On, Amen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not your normal human being. Yes, right. I quit being normal February the 11th, yes. 3 o'clock in the morning, yes. 1969, Amen. when I made Jesus the Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. And when I begin to get in His Word and find out what I can expect from Him, when I am experiencing trouble, and I did learn this from Jesus, as I've already mentioned, I can, I, can, I can live in troubled times and not be troubled by it. Can you say amen? amen. Tell somebody that. I can live in troubled times and not be troubled by it. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The Amplified describes perilous times as times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. But I want you to notice the word impossible is not in that verse. Hard to deal with and hard to bear, but not impossible to deal with and not impossible to bear. The, uh, the uh, message translation says there will be difficult times ahead. Difficult times ahead. I was, I was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi. My grandfather had a farm there. That's where my dad was raised. My grandfather bought that place in 1927. And over a period of time, he began to acquire more land than when, that he had when he first bought the place. And by the time I was born in 1946, my grandfather had nearly 70 acres. And uh, 
we were totally self-contained on that farm. We had cattle. Uh, my grandmother had a yard full of chickens. So we had eggs. We had the, we had the beef. Uh, we kept a hundred head of hogs on the place. We had our own uh, smokehouse. Uh, we and the, the top part of the farm, uh, Grandpa called it the flat because there's a lot of hills in Vicksburg, and there was one part of the farm where it was totally flat, and that's where he he, he raised all the crops, and so. We didn't have to go to town for anything unless we just wanted to. And so I'm, I'm a little boy, and uh, uh, when I remember in those early years, my grandfather plowed with a mule that he called Old Bessie. And he'd hook up Old Bessie and put those straps over him, and he'd, he'd go to the flat. He'd say, son, let's go to the flat. That's what he called it. And, and I knew that's where we were going to get the, the soil ready for the sowing. And he'd, he'd have old Bessie, and he'd go down through there plowing it. And sometimes, you know, there'd be rocks, there'd be roots, and, and he'd, uh, the plow would get stuck. And he'd have to, you know, take the straps off and get out there and dig around and get the, the debris out of the way. And uh, I remember every time I would face something difficult, and I'd say, Grandpa, this is too hard. He said, he would say this. Uh, let me, let me say it just the way I wrote it down. He said, son, it'll be a hard road to, to, to hoe, but it's not impossible. Yeah. Yeah. He'd, he'd use a kind of a farming uh, phrase, you know, uh, when it was a, a, a row that had uh, rocks and, and roots and everything. They'd say it's, it's a hard road to hoe, but he'd always say, but it's not impossible. So if I ever came up with something with, Grandpa, this is hard. He said, but it's not uh, a road that's too hard to hold. That's right. And I didn't know what he meant at first, and then I discovered what he meant. And, yeah. and he, just, he just, his attitude was, son, it may be hard, but if you persevere, you can get it done. That's right. yeah. Amen. Now, I didn't realize my grandfather was teaching me Bible principles as a young boy. I didn't know these things were in the Bible. My grandfather always said, uh, when we got the ground pre prepared and we sowed the seed, and as soon as we got through with all that, he would say, son, we're going to have good crops this year. I say, Grandpa, how do you know we're going to have good crops? And he'd always say, son, this is good old Mississippi Delta soil. You can grow anything here. Yeah. And he believed that. He believed in the seed. He believed in the soil. Amen. And he knew he was going to get a good harvest. Yeah. And we always had a good harvest. Amen. Always. I don't remember one time that we didn't have a good harvest. Because Grandpa knew if he prepared the soil properly and he sowed the seed and he watered the seed, then we're going to get a good harvest. And he'd always say, and because this is good old Mississippi Delta soil. Yeah. Now, if you know anything about the Delta, you know, that's where cotton was king. Yeah. And it was because... The Mississippi River begins way up in northern Minnesota and trickles all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Well, it brings with it all the soil, all the minerals and, and everything, and it dumps it in the Delta part of Mississippi. That's why cotton was king down there because it was raised in the Delta. And Grandpa believed that you could raise anything in good old Mississippi Delta soil. Okay? So... Uh, and then finally, uh, we were able, or he was able, to buy a 1927 Massey Ferguson tractor. That thing was like a Sherman tank. It had steel cleats on it, and in fact, I still have it today. Uh, uh, when, when I sold that property after my grandparents passed away, my father inherited it, and then when he passed away, I inherited it. And uh, it was just a few years ago when I sold it. But I went over there because I, I never get to Mississippi that very much, very much. And I went over there to pray about what I was going to do with this property. And I thought, it's, it's, it's not, you know, wise for me to keep it because I never get over here. But then I got over there and walked around the property. And I thought, there's too many fond memories here. I don't know if I can sell this place or not. Because that's, I, even though we moved when I was a young boy to Louisiana, I'd spend my summers back in Mississippi with my grandparents. And I had fond memories. 
And I started walking that place, and the old barn was still there, and that old 27 Massey Ferguson trailer was, uh, tractor was in the barn. I said, well, I may sell this place, but I'm not selling that tractor. I'm bringing it home. <laughs> and, and so I have it, and um, I'm, I'm considering restoring it. It's, it's just in my shop. But I remember riding on the back of that tractor with my grandpa, and I'd say, Grandpa, this is a whole lot better than old Bessie, isn't it? He said, oh, yeah, it's a whole lot better than old Bessie. I said, this thing is powerful, isn't it, Grandpa? He said, he said, son, I can knock a tree down with this thing. I said, show me, you know. And he'd come up on this you know, little sapling of a tree, you know, and he'd just run over that thing. It had steel cleats on it, you know, and he'd run over that thing. And, and I just, I couldn't sell that tractor because I had such fond memories of it. And, uh, but we always had great crops. And, and when it was time for harvest, and a harvest is hard work. But you do it with a smile on your face because it's harvest time. I remember years ago, I was, I was going to Kansas to preach. And I was driving back then in a Ford station wagon I had. And I'd gone through Oklahoma, and now I'm in Kansas. And uh, I saw it was harvest time in the wheat fields. And I saw uh, guys out in the field off of I-35. And I, I just saw them over in the field as I was driving up to Kansas and when I got out of the service that night, I was going to drive back to Oklahoma City. And so it's about one o'clock in the morning when I come through that same field and I could see the lights in those combines. They were out there harvesting while everybody else is asleep. They're out harvesting one o'clock in the morning. Wow, they can't let it spoil in the field, you know, but I knew they had a smile on their face, even though, you know, it's hard work, but it's harvest time. Amen. Amen. I remember uh, we bought a place out on the south side of Fort Worth a number of years ago, and it was a little farmhouse that was actually built the year I was born, 1946. And it's just a little small uh, wood frame farmhouse, only had about five acres with it, and uh, the, the owner had sold off some of the other property. And I wanted to buy that place because I don't like living in the city. I wanted to be back in the country. And so we, we bought that place, and... Uh, I remember uh, the, the, the man, his name was Mr. Lemon, George Lemon. He was 80 years old. He built the place in 46, raised his children there. And, and I bought it from him. And he was going to, him and his wife were going to go to town and get a little condo, you know. And there was too much for them to take care of anymore. But he, he had already tilled the, the ground because he had a garden every year. He already had the ground tilled and ready for planting. So I did the planting. And, of course, every time I'd come home from a meeting, I'd go out there and make sure there's no weeds and, and I'm getting the weeds away and I'm making sure it's getting pr proper uh, 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 water being irrigated. irrigated. And, uh, uh, and then when the harvest came, we had tomatoes. I mean, big tomatoes. And I love fresh tomatoes. Nothing better than a fresh tomato on a bologna sandwich. <laughs> Amen. And... Uh, so we had tomatoes, we had corn, we had beans, we had potatoes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so my girls, they didn't like me moving them to the country. They're city girls, you know. Daddy, why'd you move us out here? I said, I want you to experience country life. We don't like country life. And so when I came home, it was time to harvest because I knew I was only going to be home with just a short time. I said, girls, we got to get out there and, and gather this stuff in. They didn't want to get their nails dirty, you know. I said, come on, we're going to get it. We got to get it gathered up. They fussed the whole time they were out there. They were just young girls. And it got dark, and they thought, oh, boy, we get to quit now. I rigged up lights <laughs> out there, you know, and they just kept them out there at 1 o'clock in the morning getting all the – because I had to leave in a couple of days, and I knew it spoiled by the time I got back, and I didn't want it to spoil, you know. And, uh, but they, they didn't like that country living at all, you know. But I did. That's the way I was raised, and that's, that's what I liked. So anyway, uh, I remember going back to what my grandpa used to say. He said, son, it'll be a hard road to hoe, but it's not impossible. Right. Amen. Amen. So I'd, I'd like to say that this is what Paul meant when he said, <laughs> yeah. perilous times are here. That's right. Amen. Hard to deal with and hard to bear, but not impossible. not impossible. 
It'll be a hard road to hoe, but it's not impossible. Can you identify with that? Give the Lord a shout if you can. Praise God. Amen. So I, I believe Paul is telling us that even though hard times and troubled times are on the horizon and we're already in them, we haven't seen the worst of it yet. But he goes on to say in verse 14, he said, but continue thou in the things which you have learned and been assured of. That's, right. that's, that's what I believe is the solution to these hard times yeah, right. and these troubled times. Continue in the things which you have learned. Now, if you haven't learned anything, uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> but it's not too late to learn. That's right. Now, you got, a lot of, you got a lot of studying to do, but, but it's not too late, Amen. you know. I mean, you can make it in the midnight hour. I wouldn't suggest you wait that long. Right. But he said, continue in the things which you have learned. Well, when I read that, I, I go back to thinking of all the things that I've learned in my 54 years of walking with God and living this life of faith. Yeah. And the principles have never changed. Now, I know a whole lot more about them. Yeah. And I have a whole lot more testimonies from applying them, but <clears throat> the principles have not changed at all. I'm still doing today what I learned to do 54 years ago, yeah. and it's still working for Amen. me. Amen. Now, one of the first things I learned, and I learned it from Kenneth Copeland back there in 1969, uh, after he left uh, Shreveport and went on back to Fort Worth, there was a lady in the church that had recorded all of the messages he preached there. He was there for a week in the church that Carolyn grew up in, and he preached three services a day for a week. That's 21 messages. And she recorded them on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And the, the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, that I surrendered my life to the Lord, she was at my house at 9 o'clock that same morning. And, and when I went to the door, she said, Jerry, God told me she had a paper bag in her, in her hand, and she said, God told me if you'll listen to these, it'll change your life. I said, what is it? She said, it's all the messages that Kenneth Copeland preached while he was here this week. 21 messages, and they're on reel-to-reel -reel tape. And God told me to bring them to you. And if you listen to them, it'll change your life. Yeah. I said, well, how am I supposed to listen to them? She said, you don't have a tape player? I said, no, I don't. She said, I'll be right back. So she went home, came back in about 15 minutes. And she said, I was hoping, God told me to give you my tape player, but I was hoping you already had one, so I wouldn't have to give you mine. So I went back and got it. And, she, and of course, he was a big tape player, this yeah. big, had two external speakers you attached to it. You know, he didn't carry it around like a Sony Walkman, you know. I mean, you set it on a credenza. And I set it up in my guest bedroom and started listening to those messages. And she was right. They changed my life. Okay. So I began learning these principles of the life of faith Amen. immediately. Now you have to understand, I, I, I didn't have any religious thinking. Yeah. Now, I, I, I grew up in a little Baptist church, a little country Baptist church, but I don't remember anything they said other than I, I don't remember a day that I didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Right. I mean, that was ingrained in me as a little boy. I believe he died on the cross. I believed he was raised from the dead. I believed he was coming back someday. But you can believe all that and never make him Lord of your life. Right. And that was my problem. I heard all those things, but I'd never made him Lord of my life until February 1969. Okay? So <clears throat> I started listening to those messages by Kenneth Copeland. And the first one that he preached there, he called it simply the word of faith. And he started dealing with the principles that he had learned from Kenneth Hagan. Now, he, he had flown a co-pilot on Oral Roberts' airplane, but he was listening to Kenneth Hagan's messages. He said, I, I listened to Brother Hagan's messages, and then I saw Oral Roberts appropriating them in his meetings. Yeah. Okay? And so <clears throat> the first thing that he taught on this message called the Word of Faith was the power of words. Because Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, if, 
Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Amen. And so he taught it, started talking about on this first tape, the power of words, which I had no idea that my words would make me or break me. I had no idea that my words, I was, in, I was ensnared by my words. I was taken captive by my words. But as I listened to those messages, uh, uh, that first message on the power of words, it hit me. And I thought back over things in my life and, and thought back of things I had said before those things happened. Yeah. And I said, Lord, is that why that happened to me? He said, that's exactly why it happened to you. He said, the only reason you're still alive is I protected you. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know, yeah. you know. Now, you know, when you know <laughs> and you still ignore those truths, yes. that's not very smart, Amen. okay? Amen. And you will smart for it, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So I learned about the power of words. And so I remember uh, Carolyn, now she's been filled with the Holy Ghost since she's eight years old. And, and she, she'd been in a Pentecostal church all of her life, but she didn't know these things, Okay until she heard Kenneth Copeland preach about them. And so she, she was helping me, and, and I'm learning, and, and I'm sharing with her things I've learned from Brother Copeland's messages, and, and we're listening to them together. And we made a pact with one another that if either one of us talked negative, sickness, disease, lack, want, that, that the other would say, okay, that's your confession. I agree with it, and it'll come to pass. And we'd say, no, I break the power of those words. I don't want that to come to pass. Anybody else ever do that? And so, you know, we were, you know, uh, I, I, I was not having a problem with healing. I don't know. I just, when I found out by stripes I was healed, I mean, my faith just grabbed hold of that. And I, I was not having a problem with healing. But finances, oh, my Lord, I could not figure out how God could, could supply my need without me working in my business. Because my dad taught me how to work as a young boy. I've been, I've been working since I'm nine years old. And, and the only scripture my dad ever taught me as a young boy was, he said, the Bible said, I didn't know where it was, but dad said he was in there. A man that don't work, don't eat. I believed him and I like to eat, so I went to work, you know. And then when I got married, he said, now son, there's another scripture I want to share with you. He said, a man that don't take care of his Family is worse than an infidel. My daddy said that's in the Bible. I believed him. I didn't know what an infidel was, but it didn't sound good, so I wanted to take care of my family, you know. I mean, didn't want to be one. So that's the only two verses my daddy ever taught me, but those were good verses, praise God. Amen. And so uh, I, I couldn't figure out how can God supply my needs? I mean, I shut my business down, I don't have a job. He told me to spend the next three months giving him no less than eight hours a day studying the Word. How am I going to get food on the table? I got babies to take care of. I got a house note. I got a truck note. I got a car note. I mean, we were in debt to everything. And I don't have a job. How's God going to take care of me? And it wasn't until 1969, Oral Roberts had a primetime television program, and I didn't ever miss it. And, and when it came on, I was sitting there glued to the television set. And he held up that little book and said, I've just written a brand new book. And if you'll write to me and ask for it, I'll send it to you absolutely free and postpaid. I turned to Carolyn and said, Carolyn, get the address. Here's one we can afford. <laughs> and she wrote to Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association, got the number off the screen. And this little book came in the mail, and I devoured it. And this is the little book that taught me Amen. how to make God my source of supply. Amen. And from that day until now, Amen. God has taken yes, good sir. care yes, of the Savell household Amen. and the Savell ministry, Hallelujah. praise God. That's the reason why I, I, I said to Richard not too long ago, I said, Richard, do you guys still have your dad's book, The Miracle of Seed, Faith, and Print? He said, I don't know. He said, it's been out of print for a long time. I'll check. I say, well, if you still have it, I want as many of them as you can, you can get me because every time I mention this, people want to know, is it still available? Yeah. So they found out they had about a thousand left and I got them. Yeah. And so, so I, I, I tell people, this is, this is the book that taught me how to make 
God, my source of supply. Amen. Amen. And so from that, I began to learn how to trust God in troubled times. How to trust God in troubled times. And then right along with that little book is the next thing that God began to show me was the favor of God. Amen. Now, when you learn seed faith and you know you have favor with God, yes, sir. Yes, sir. no devil can defeat you. That's right. I said, you can sow your way out of any situation and the favor of God will make it happen for you. Right. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about favor tonight. Amen. Let's, let's notice here, the message translation says, there will be difficult times ahead. Now, in, um, go with me to Psalm 9, if you will, please. And I want to show you some verses of what you and I can expect from God in troubled times. These are just a few verses. There are many, but for the sake of time, I can't share all of them with you because there's too much other material I want to leave with you before the service is over tonight. Psalm 9, and let's see what we can expect from God in troubled times. In verse 9, the Lord also will be a refuge in the time of trouble. Amen. The Lord also will be a refuge in times of trouble. The word refuge means a place of shelter and protection. The message translation says he will be a sanctuary during bad times. And I think it's interesting that the Amplified adds this. In times of trouble and in times of high cost. I think that's very appropriate for today. In times of high cost and desperation, uh, God will be a place of shelter for us. Psalm 20 verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob will defend thee. The Passion Translation says, and may supernatural help be sent from his sanctuary. The Message Translation says, and put you out of harm's reach and send reinforcements and dispatch fresh supplies. I think I ought to read that again. Now listen to this. The Passion Translation says, May he send supernatural help from his sanctuary. The Message Translation says, Put you out of harm's reach, send reinforcements, and dispatch fresh supplies. I remember one year when Happy and Jeannie and Carolyn and I and Buddy and Pat Harrison were on a vacation in Honolulu that we did every year for many, many years, about 40 years. And we'd go in January. And uh, this one particular time, this is in the early days of my ministry. And we got home. I flew back from Honolulu and we got home. And usually we, got, we land real early in the morning. They'd pick us up at the airport. And we'd go to the house. And, and we'd sleep for until noon or 1 o'clock. And then I'd get up and get ready to go over to the office, you know. Well, I got up that, that morning. And, uh, and back then I only had just a handful of employees and, and they knew I just got home. So they didn't bother me, but about one o'clock I got a knock on the door and it was my office manager. And he said, brother Jerry, uh, is this a good time to talk to you? I said, yeah, I've, I've just got up from some rest and got a shower and I'm just about to come to the office. He said, well, um, I'm sorry to come to the house, but, uh, I, I didn't want to bother you while he was on vacation. But we got some we got some trouble that we're dealing with. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, I'm ashamed to tell you this. And he said, uh, I, I probably get fired for it. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, I haven't paid the payroll taxes in six months. Mm -hmm. And he just stopped right there. And I thought about firing him. <laughs> I thought about slugging him. I thought about running over him with my car. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I thought of all kinds of things. I said, you haven't paid the payroll taxes in the last six months? No. I said, why? 
that's, that's not something that we overlook. He said, well, there were so many other things that we needed the money for. And I thought, well, the money will come in and I'll pay for it. But it didn't come in. And now we're six months behind with penalties. And, and we owe the IRS $100,000, over $100,000. Now, this is back in the days when $100,000 might have been, you know, millions today. It was hard to come by. And my, my ministry is still in somewhat of an infant stage. And when he said, with penalties and everything, we owe over $100,000. I said, well, go back to the office and I'll tell you after I seek the Lord what to do. So I'm, I'm in, the, in my study there at the house. And I said, Lord, <clears throat> in fact, the first thing I did I said out loud, I don't deserve this. It didn't help. <laughs> it didn't help the situation at all. But I thought it was a good, good time to say that. I mean, I'm out here preaching my heart out, trying to help people. Then I come back home and I'm over $100,000 in debt and I don't have the money. And I said, I don't deserve this. He said, that's not going to make any, it's not going to change the situation. Yeah. I said, well, what do I do, Lord? And he led me to the book of Acts. And it was where Paul is, is out on the sea in a ship and the, and the storm, hurricane proportion storm comes and the ship is breaking apart. They're throwing the cargo over, you know, and everybody's life is in danger. Yeah. And he said, read that story again. I said, Lord, I know that story. What does that have to do with my situation? <laughs> he said, read it again. So I read it. I said, Lord, that's a wonderful story. I've preached on it before. But what does it have to do with my situation? He said, read it again. Mm -hmm. I read it again. I said, Lord, I, I don't understand what this has got to do with my situation. He said, read it again. I read it again. I said, I know I'm missing it, but would you, instead of having me read it again, would you just go ahead and explain to me what you're trying to get across to me? He said, I want you to notice that when Paul was in danger of him and the entire crew of losing their lives, I sent an angel and told him, be of good cheer. The ship will only be lost, but none of the lives. I said, okay, I read that, but what's that have to do with me? I said, he said, son, I'm the captain of your salvation, and the captain never jumped ship. Praise God. Praise God. That just hit me. Amen. He said, I'm the captain of your salvation. I didn't jump ship on Paul, and I'm not going to jump Amen. ship on you. Amen. He said, now do what I told Paul to do through that angel. Glory to God. Be of good cheer. Amen. I said, oh, over $100,000. He said, the ship is sinking, but you can stop it by being of good cheer. Amen. So I got up. Hallelujah. Did my best to be of good cheer. Uh -huh. how, do you, how do you be of good cheer with this thought hanging over you? Yeah, yeah over $100,000. And if you don't get it paid today, the interest on it is going to keep building, building, building. You know, yeah. what, it, it could be 200000 in 30 days, right. you know. And he said, just be of good cheer. So I started out, and I'd heard Brother Hagin say before, you know, about, you know, uh, laughing at the devil. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. And he said, sometimes it just comes out as ha, ha, with no real, you know, spunk in it. Yeah. And he said, but the more you do it, you finally, it'll get a hold of you. Yeah. And next thing you know, you're, you're you, I mean, you're, you're full of joy and laughing at sure. the devil and knowing that God is going to turn this situation around. So I just started out with a ha-ha, and in a little while, boy, the joy of the Lord hit me, and I am laughing, woke Carolyn up. She come down there. She said, what in the world is going on down here? I said, we owe over $100,000, and we don't have it. Ah, ha, ha. And I just started laughing, and, and I know more than got that out of my mouth, and the phone rang. Now listen to this. 
The Passion Translation says, supernatural help will be sent. In time of trouble, supernatural help will be sent. The Message Translation says, and he'll put you out of harm's reach, send reinforcements, and dispatch fresh supplies. So the phone rang, and I answered it, and, and the person on the other end said, are you home yet? I said, yes. He said, uh, and this is before cell phones, way before cell phone. I said, that, this is my home number you just called. He said, oh, I thought I was calling your office. He said, uh, well, I'm glad you're home. He said, uh, can you and Carolyn, uh, could you guys meet us uh, later tonight and have dinner with us? We'd like to talk to you about something. I said, well, yeah, sure we can. We don't have any other plans. So we met them at some place and had dinner with them. And they said, uh, man, there's so much noise going on in here and the tables are so close. We don't want everybody hearing what we want to discuss. Can we go back home with you? I said, sure. So they came to the house and we're all sitting there. And he said, now, uh, the Lord told me that you are in desperate need of $100,000. I said, the Lord has spoken correctly. He said, uh, uh, well, could you use a little more than that? I said, um, if you insist. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, I brought a check for over $100,000 because I, I originally had written it for 100000 but the Lord said, make it for a little more than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it took care of that and the interest that had accumulated even since I had gotten home. Glory took God. care of that. Supernatural help, Glory praise God. God. Supernatural help. Now, he didn't tell me that while I was in my study that he'd already spoken to somebody before he ever had me read the book of Acts four times. He didn't bother telling me, by the way, I've already taken care of this. No, he, he insisted that I follow the scriptural pattern of what to do in time of trouble. Be of good cheer. Because supernatural help is headed your way. Amen. I'm sending reinforcements. Amen. I'm dispatching new and fresh supplies. Hallelujah. And if he'd do it for me, why wouldn't he do it for you? Praise God. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen? Look at your neighbor and say, this is the way I look when I'm of good cheer. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Some of you may be in facing some trouble like that. Maybe not the exact situation, but you got your own trouble. And uh, have you thought about being a good cheer in the midst of it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Be of good cheer. I am, I am sending supernatural help. God's always working behind the scenes. Amen. That's one of the things that, that I've learned over the years. And I haven't had days like that anymore. I've never gone through anything quite like that. Again, it seems to me like once you learn a lesson, you don't have to go back and repeat it. You just keep acting on the principles that you learned in that lesson. Okay. And that was a long time ago. And of course, today we, we, we deal in millions of dollars to run the ministry, you know, yeah. millions of dollars. And, and God has taken good care of us. We have not suffered uh, even during covid we, we broke every record in 2020. And in 2021, we broke all those records. And in 2022, we broke 2021's records. 2023, we broke 2022 records. And we're on target right now to break all of 2023's records. Amen. Happens to you all the time. Amen. Hallelujah. I've learned to be of good cheer, even in the midst of trouble, praise God. Because I know that I know that supernatural help is on its way. I know that I know that I am not, I'm going to be taken out of harm's reach. And I know that I know that uh, reinforcements are coming my way. And I know that I know that God is dispatching fresh supplies. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout if you believe it. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Now, let's go to... Uh, Psalm 27, talking about what we can expect from God in times of trouble. Verse 5, 
in for in time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. And then it goes on to say in the latter part of that verse, he shall set me upon a rock. The message Bible says or refers to this scripture as, or let me state that. The message Bible refers to pavilion as a quiet and secure place. The perfect getaway. God provides a perfect getaway. <laughs> Amen. A safe and secure place. Psalm 107, verse 28. They cried, and the Lord heard their trouble. Or they cried in, unto the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. Psalm 138, verse 7 says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, Thou wilt deliver me. The Passion Translation says, I can walk through any devastation. Your power sets me free. Amen. And once again, as I said, there's, there's so many more verses that you could read about what you can expect God to do in times of trouble. But for the sake of time, that's all I'm going to read to you at this point so I can get to the major part of the theme of my message, and that is favor in troubled times. Favor in troubled times. That's what I expect. I expect the favor of God to show up in my life every day of my life. And those that travel with me and work with me know that it happens in some way every day of my life before I go to bed. Every day. Not occasionally. Every day. I see the favor of God showing up in some way. Small things, big things, impossible looking things. Why? Because I expect it. And you get exactly what you expect. Good or bad, negative or positive. But I expect, I get up every day and I declare before I leave my house, the favor of God will show up in my life today. The favor of God's going to open doors for me that no man can shut. The favor of God is going to give me preferential treatment. The favor of God is going to give me great victories Amen. in the midst of great battles. Yes. Amen. The favor of God Amen. is going to cause prosperity to come my way. Yes. Oh, Amen. God. The favor of God is going to cause me to be in the right place at the right time, oh, doing the right God. thing, Amen. meeting the right people. Amen. 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 I declare that every day. Yes, and the Bible says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established Amen. unto thee. The little Hebrew uh, implies that if you say it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence in your life. Amen. So if you walk out of here tonight and say, well, I'm going to try that. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to say those things. Well, if you say it just because I say it, you may not get the same results. Yeah. But if you say it repeatedly Amen. until you believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And if you say it enough, you are going to believe it. That's right. Amen. 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 The Apostle Paul, quoting the psalmist, he says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. Yeah. Amen. You, you eventually say it so much, you believe it. And because you believe it, you keep saying it so much. Amen. And you say it so much, you believe it more. And you believe it more, and you keep saying it. It's an unending cycle, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Say this with me. The favor of God is on my life right now, right in this place, this very moment. The favor of God is on my life. When I leave here tonight, the favor of God's going with me. And when I wake up in the morning, the favor of God will go before me, opening doors that no man can shut, arranging things to happen in my behalf that only favor can do. And I give God praise for it. Come on, give him a great shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When you know that you know that you have access to the favor of God, that it's on your life. And by the way, you got it the day you made Jesus the Lord of your life. Amen. You're not going to get it when you get to heaven. You're not going to get it if you're a good enough Christian. You can't earn it. 
In fact, every time you see the word grace in, in the uh, New Testament, particularly from the Amplified Bible, it is defined as unmerited favor. That's what grace is. You don't deserve it, but God did it anyway. You, 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 can't, you can't do enough good deeds to get the favor of God. You can't become a good enough Christian to get the favor of God. God loved you while you were yet a sinner. And because he loved you when you were a sinner, he didn't want to leave you as a sinner. Remember the old song, just as I am, just as I am. Well, he didn't leave you just as you am. He made you the righteousness of God and he imparted his blessing in your life. He imparted his favor in your life. I call that the winning combination. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's on you right now. So you can say to trouble, are you kidding me? You think you're going to discourage me? You think you're going to make me be sad all day? No, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to shout unto my God. I'm going to be of good cheer because the favor of God is going to change my situation and turn impossibilities into possibilities. Hallelujah. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Come on, shout. Shout unto God if you believe it. Hallelujah. You can get to the place where you can say like Paul, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Psalm 512. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, and it will compass him as with a shield. How many of you are the righteousness of God? Once again, you didn't earn it. Jesus got it for you. He was made to be sin that you might be made righteous, which just simply means having right standing with God. And here Psalm 5 says, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous, and with favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Another translation says, The favor of God will surround you like a shield. Sometimes I get up, and before I leave the house, I just do this. Not say a word. What am I doing? I'm walking out the door with the favor of God surrounding me as a shield. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I dare you at work tomorrow, wherever you work, walk into your place of employment doing this. And people, just wait till people say, what are you doing? And you can say, you should have been in church last night. Okay. Amen. So the favor of God will surround you like a shield. Now, Job chapter 10 and verse 12 says this. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. You have granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. The word preserved means upheld and sustained. Keep you in a sound state. That's what the favor of God will do when it's surrounding you. It will uphold you. It will sustain you. It will keep you in a sound state. And the phrase sound state means uh, not bruised or crushed by trouble. Not bruised or, trust, or crushed. Amen. The revelation of God's favor during troubled times will keep your spirit from being crushed. It causes or enables you to hold your head up high and not be discouraged even though trouble is pressing toward you. Instead of being negative, you're able to maintain a positive confession. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. In the multitude of sin... <clears throat> <clears throat> it says there, there, there wanteth not sin. In other words, if you're doing a lot of talking, more than likely you're going to get into sin. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, sin means to miss the mark. And if you keep talking, you ever get around people that just talk all the time? Yes, sir. But don't, don't talk, just listen. After a while, You'll locate them, like Brother Hagin used to say, by their confession. They're talking their trouble. They just talk, talk, talk. It says, in the multitude of words, in a little while, 
somebody's going to be missing the mark. Amen. But he that is wise refrains his lips. Right. See, the person who understands they have the favor of God, they refrain their lips in troubled times. Amen. They don't talk the trouble. Amen. They talk favor. Right. They don't talk the trouble. They talk the blessing. Amen. Amen. And, and a lot of people, they, they mistake, uh, you know, you talking favor and not trouble as being egotistical. It's not egotistical. Right. It's not prideful. I just know what I have. Yeah. I just know who I am in Christ. Right. I just know what is available to me. Yes. Amen. And some people, I mean, it seems like to me, some people, they feel it's their call in life to try to get you to talk like they talk. Uh -huh. right. Negative. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't join in the conversation. Right. Right. I've got to where I can look at a person that's talking negative all day, put a smile on my face, and never hear another word they say. Yeah. Yeah. And they think I'm listening. <laughs> and they just walk away. <laughs> Amen. I don't want to hear that. I, I get tickled to these people that are constantly trying to push CNN on me. I, I get text messages. Did you hear this? Did you hear this? CNN? No, I don't want to hear that. What, you don't watch CNN? No. You don't want to be informed? Are you kidding me? That's where you get your information? Like Brother Copeland said one time, he said, do you know why they have to print the newspaper again every day? Because today's news will be tomorrow's old news. So they have to reprint it. He said, the best thing to do, now this is Kenneth Copeland, he said this, the best thing to do with a newspaper is put it in the bottom of a bird cage. He knows what to do with it. <laughs> okay, that's Kenneth Copeland. That wasn't me, okay? But that's good advice, you know. The bird knows what to do with it. <laughs> okay. Watch your words in times of trouble. That's the, that's the theme there. Watch your words in time of trouble. Amen. You can hinder, you, you can be your greatest hindrance by the things that are coming out of your mouth. It's during times of trouble we need to watch our words more so than at any other time. Instead of talking the trouble, talk favor. Yeah. Instead of talking the trouble, talk the blessing. Talk the Amen. Now, Zechariah chapter 4. Go there with me for a moment. Zechariah chapter 4. Favor in troubled times. Hallelujah. Now we know in Jesus' teaching on Mark the 11th chapter, 23rd verse, talks about what we're supposed to do when we are experiencing mountains in our lives, right? Say unto the mountain. Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, talk to the mountain. I remember one time, uh, Brother Copeland and I were preaching in, in London. And it was one of our first believers conventions in England. And it was Brother Copeland, Gloria, and myself. And uh, Brother Copeland started the meeting that night, and I was going to do the first morning service. And I'm sitting in the service listening to him. And all of a sudden, the Lord asked me something. And it really didn't have anything to do with what Brother Copeland was talking about at the, at the moment. And he said this, Why is it important for you to talk to your mountain? And before I could answer, he said, Because if you don't, your mountain will talk to you. I thought, that's a good revelation. I bet Kenneth Hagin didn't even know that. <laughs> if you don't talk to your mountain, they will talk to you. They'll wake you up in the middle of the night. I think it's interesting, too, that, you know, we've even got the term monology. I'm in a, I have a mountain of debt. What are you doing about that mountain of debt? Jesus said, Speak to the mountain. That's right. Now, notice here in Zechariah chapter 4, in verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, saying, Grace, grace unto it. Notice he says, Say grace, grace unto the mountain. 
What is grace? Unmerited favor. You can shout favor to your mountains. Amen. 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 When that, when that mountain arises in your life, a mountain of dead, a mountain of sickness and disease, a mountain of trouble, instead of talking about the mountain, say to the mountain, favor, favor. Amen. I have favor. Glory to God. Just keep pronouncing the favor of God over that mountain and it will become a plain hallelujah. hallelujah. <clears throat> Can you say amen? amen? Let your neighbor say, now that was worth coming to the service tonight. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 16, verse five. I love this. Favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. Favor is is as a cloud of the latter rain. The message translation says, like spring rain and sunshine. Here's what I wrote in my notes. The favor of God being like spring, uh, spring rain and sunshine implies that it can turn a dark and dreary day into a bright and happy day. Yes. That's what the favor of God is capable of doing turning a dark and dreary day into a bright and happy day. Amen. Amen. Did you notice in Exodus chapter 3, when God's people were in bondage to Egypt, and if you read all that they went through, I'd call that troubled times, right? Amen. Amen. And what did God say to Moses? And then Moses says to the people, I will give this people favor. I will give this people favor. Yes. That's right. In the midst of their trouble and in the midst of their bondage, God said the solution to it was, I'm going to give them favor. Amen. That's still the solution today. Yes. Yes. I will give them favor. Yes. Not only did the favor cause them to be delivered out of the bondage of Egypt, but it caused restoration of everything the Egyptians had taken from that generation Amen. and the previous generations for 400 years. Yes. They, the favor of God caused that generation to walk out of there with everything that was owed to them and their forefathers. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. That's what the favor of God can do. Yes, sir. It can not only deliver you from the bondage you're in, uh, <clears throat> but it can bring restoration of everything Satan has stolen from you amen. when you're in that bondage. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? He said, I will give this people favor. Glory to God. So I think it's, I think I, I tell people this all the time. Do yourself a favor and study favor. Amen. <laughs> it's the solution to troubled times. And I will drink to that. It's the solution to troubled times. Now, let me end it with this tonight. Go to Psalm 102. I'm not done. I'm just trying to find a place to stop. Because I don't ever get tired of talking about favor. <clears throat> Psalm 102. And let's begin in verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. And Zion is symbolic of the church or the body of Christ. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her Yea, the set time is come. Notice, the time to favor the church, the time to favor your people has come. The set time has come. Amen. Now, it's been said, and I've, I've said this many times myself, that God is a God of patterns. A God of patterns. And you remember, the children of Israel, as we just talked about, when they were in bondage, how did God deliver them? By sending favor. Amen. I will give this people favor. Okay? God being a God of patterns, then here we're talking about, you know, years later, the psalmist says, thou will arise and have uh, 
mercy on Zion and you will, uh, the, the set time for favor has come. Now, if God is a God of patterns, then that says to me that God's people can depend on Him displacing, uh, uh, distributing His favor Amen. in times of great trouble and Amen. stress, hard to deal with and hard to bear. If you will look at Psalm 102, in my Bible, there's a heading right under Psalm 102. And it says that the psalmist wrote this during a time of great affliction. And what is he doing? He starts out talking about the trouble he's in, yes. but then he remembers what God did yeah. when his people were in trouble in Egypt. And he says, he comes to this conclusion, hey, I'm experiencing the same kind of affliction they were experiencing, and you sent your favor and delivered them. Yeah. Apparently favor comes in times of trouble. The set time has come for me. The set time has come for me. How about any of you in here? Has the set time come for you? The set time for favor. So if you're in times of trouble today, if you're experiencing hardships and facing impossible looking situations, don't give up because you are in position right now. If you will just persevere, if you'll stay with God, stay on his word, be of good cheer. Amen. Don't allow yourself to get discouraged then you have entered into a place, another translation says, an appointed time for set time. You've entered into a place where God has, has enabled you to reach this place of a, an appointment for the favor of God to manifest in your life Amen. and deliver you Amen. just like He delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. Not only deliver them, but see to it that everything that was taken from them during that time is restored back to them. Praise God. Amen. So I want to leave this with you tonight. You can have favor in troubled times. That's how you can do what Jesus said in the midst of trouble, not be troubled by it. Hallelujah. Do I look like I'm troubled by what's going on in the world? I am not troubled in the least. I refuse to be because I know that I know that the favor of God goes before me. The favor of God surrounds me. It's my set time to experience it again. Hallelujah. And it's your set time to experience it again. So I want to encourage you, go home tonight. And before you go to bed, dance a little jig in front of the bed there. Be a good cheer and just tell the devil, you said what? No way, devil. I'm headed for the favor of God. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a great shout tonight. Amen. You receive that? All right. Stand to your feet if you will, please. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't you love the Word of God? Yes, sir. My goodness. Anybody got any mountains in their life tonight? You have some mountains in your life tonight? Hold your hand up. All right, now, point like you're pointing to that mountain. And say this. Favor. 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 I say favor. Favor. To every mountain in my life. And the favor of God is going to cause you to become a plain. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord another shout of praise? Hallelujah. Amen. Father, I pray over every person in here tonight. I pray that the word has been rich on the inside of them. And they'll take it with them. Not allow Satan to steal it from them. They will appropriate it. They will act upon it. They will apply it. And your word declares that you confirm your word with signs following. So I'm believing that tonight's message has helped a number of people in here. And hopefully everybody in here. And I'm expecting some major testimonies. Some major breakthroughs to come forth as a result of hearing what they've heard tonight. In Jesus' name, and I thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord another good shout of praise. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Are you helped tonight? Isn't the Lord good? Praise God. Well, we're not going to keep you very... Sit down for just one minute. We're not going to keep you long. We're going to uh, dismiss. But I, uh, I always like to just...
take a moment and just share. I was uh, uh, sharing this evening that I always consider myself blessed because my my heroes are in the in the house. Amen. And um, you know, years ago, years ago, we had just first we had just started pastoring. We'd only been pastoring about a year, and I didn't know what I was doing. I knew how to preach, but I certainly didn't know how to pastor. And uh, I'd get up every Sunday and every Wednesday and spit fly and preach. I mean, I just, I thought if you didn't sweat through your shirt and your jacket and go through a, two handkerchiefs, you didn't get anything done. And uh, we went to camp meeting one year, Brother Hagin's camp meeting, and we didn't have any money, so we could only afford to stay one night. Uh, but we went, and uh, we happened to be in the service and, and we went to the morning service, and uh, Pastor Caldwell and Miss Jeannie were ministering. And uh, he was ministering on faith. You know, Brother Hagan liked to minister on faith in the mornings, and then the, the evening services were reserved for the movement of the Holy Spirit. But Pastor ministered on five ways to plant your faith. And it just impacted my life. Well, uh, the church had sent us with a little money to be able to buy some product. And I went back to his product table, and I bought the series Eagle Leadership. And the first CD in there was 12 Acres of Vision. And I said, well, I don't have 12 acres, but I need vision. And it was the first minister I'd ever heard talk about the vision that God would give you. And I said, that's what I'm missing, is I know how to preach, but I, don't, I didn't have a vision. All right? Impacted my life. You, you, you uh, fast forward a few years, and Michelle and I were, were going through some challenges, and it, uh, the challenge was, was so tough that she had taken a job, and she was working nights, and she would come and, and uh, minister on Sunday at the church, and then uh, in the evening service, and then drive to Topeka, what's that, lead worship, and then leave and go to her job and work all night. And uh, one day she was driving, one evening she was driving to that job and just, you know, if you've ever been there, you, the only thing you can do is just cry out to the Lord. And she turned the CD on and it was Brother Jerry. And he made this statement. He said, if you stop now, you're going to miss everything. That if you stop now, you're going to miss manifestations of the favor of God like you never knew before impacted our life. See, that's what I'm telling you. You got a rescue tonight. You, you heard something tonight that rescued you and your life's never going to be the same. Isn't that right? Raises and bonuses. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord's good. Amen. Let's stand up tonight. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Good to see everybody, all of our ministry friends again. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord's good. Amen. Well, as we get ready to go, let's say our vision tonight, shall we? Hallelujah. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers.